good afternoon, everyone. Um, they gave us the simple topic, the future of radio. Where do you go from there? I can look back, before I introduce my panel, to the past of radio, because my own infatuation with radio began as a, a kid when I built my own equivalent of a crystal set, if anyone even has any idea of what that was. But instead of a crystal, I used a little diode, and I was able to pick up Radio Aaron on that little diode with a set of headphones. Then it was Radio Luxembourg, the infatuation. Then we had the beginning of RTE, and we, we had no 2FM, of course, until 1979. Uh, and then we had pirate radio, we had independent radio, we had 2FM. We had gone in the meantime from the medium wave to the FM network. Then we moved on through DAB, and finally we have digital streaming, and we have time-shifting listening in the form of podcasts. I've seen it all. But I can't see the future, and that's why we are going to have a, a panel discussion now as to what may lie ahead. Um, we all have great ideas how we can ent entertain our listeners, but the question is, can we get paid for entertaining our listeners? That is probably the biggest question of all. So I want you to welcome our panel. No applause until all four of them are on the rostrum. So will you welcome, please, first of all, a man who's Associate Professor at the School of Communications at DCU and Chair of Contemporary Screen Studies. Among other works, he co-authored Irish Media, A Critical History. That was in 2017. He's acted as the principal Irish investigator on all three iterations of the European Commission-funded media pluralism monitor. Uh, he did lots more as well. Without further ado, Dr. Roddy Flynn. Moving on quickly, we'll uh, meet someone who's Deputy Chief Executive of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland uh, from the beginning in 2009, but even before that, in its two previous iterations, uh, the BCI and its predecessor, the IRTC, deeply involved in the formulation of policy and implementation of legislation emanating both locally and uh, from European uh, sources as well. Will you welcome, uh, without applause, Celine Craig. Um, next person is someone I've known, man and boy. Uh, he was involved with me when we created the first Current Affairs Drive Time program on RT Radio, and that was today at five, and we have soldiered together on both radio and television uh, for many, many years until he frightened me into leaving and going to news talk. But that's, a, that's another story entirely. Um, his uh, rise was nothing short of meteoric. I mean, he had many things to his credit, like executive producer of The Late Late Show, also was involved in the opening ceremony of the Special Olympics at Croke Park. He became a director of uh, Managing Director of uh, Radio One, then Managing Director of All Radio, and then finally, uh, he is Director of Content, in which capacity he's responsible for both radio, television, and also online content. And if that is not enough, he looks after the orchestras and the choirs as well. And that's Jim Jennings. And finally, He's had more jobs in Irish broadcasting than I've had hot dinners. Um, he made his name as a producer of the legendary Jerry Ryan show. Then he left the comfort of public service broadcasting uh, to go into the private sector, became chief executive of Today FM. And if there's ever the definition of a, a survivor, it's him. He supervised the transition. I think there was three ownerships of um, Today FM, and he survived them all and ended up uh, when uh, Today FM became part of Communicore. Then it was back to RTE as a group commercial director, from which post he finally departed a couple of years ago to become chair of iRadio. And as if that wasn't enough to do with his time, he was uh, the president of the Institute of Directors, a board member of the HSE, not his fault, the trolleys, I hasten to add, and uh, also chairman of IBI. That's Willie O'Reilly. Applause for them all, please. <laughs> Okay, um, we'll, we'll go academic first of all, um, and we might uh, go to, uh, Roddy, first of all, uh, in terms of the future of radio, does anyone, and we'll start with you, have any doubt that radio has a future? Well, I don't. Um, and I mean, my first thought when I was asked that question was, you know, predicting the future is a fool's game, clearly, as, uh, as Michael has pointed out with regard to Ivan. Um, maybe the better thing is to try and say, rather than what, will happen is to say what should happen. Um, but just in terms of what I think will happen, yeah, radio's got a future. I mean, from an academic perspective, I went all the way back to the 1920s and to a particular cultural theorist, Raymond Williams, some of you may have come across him, 
And he asked the question, why did radio, which had been around as a technology since, as a, you know, as a theoretical tool since the 1860s, as a person-to-person -person communications technology since the 1890s, why did it suddenly in the 1920s turn into this broadcasting kind of form? And he says it's a response to what's happening outside, right? So to the broader kind of social environment. And the way that he framed it then was is that society was changing from a society, which is becoming, I suppose, a modern society, a globalizing society, where events that were far distant, geographically distant on the other side of the planet, suddenly mattered in ordinary people's lives in a way that they hadn't mattered, like maybe even 50 years or certainly 100 years previously. So radio was a response you know, to that changing broader sort of social, a whole range of kind of social and, and, and political and cultural changes. I don't really see why that will go away uh, looking to the next 10 years. We are still in an environment where, in fact, if anything, our need to know what's going on in the world outside is more intense now than it has ever been. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll um, pick you up on mm -mm. Use this one. I'll pick you up on that because uh, you talk to people in their late teens, early 20s, and um, I remember I was driving along with uh, one of my girls uh, and a news program was on and something was announced about something that was happening. And um, I thought that she was listening. But about 10 minutes later, we had moved on and the program had moved on and she said, Dad, by the way, there was a shooting in Washington. I said, Nicole, yeah. you heard that on the radio 10 minutes ago, but she didn't see it as news until she saw it on her phone. That's the challenge. Jim, you're looking intrigued. <laughs> no, it, is, it is the challenge, and I have young kids as well, and I mean, I'm sure we get into this, you know, the distribution methods and how people access news. But I mean, I think the real advantage the radio has um, over a lot of other media is that it's, it's, it's immediate, you know. Uh, the internet is also immediate. Um, as you said, like, radio is quicker than the internet in that, in, in that case. Um, and the radio will always be relevant because particularly live broadcasting, uh, which, you know, where it can't be time shifted, can't be interfered with, and the voices are as you hear them um, as they're broadcast, I think that is the strength of radio. So, um, Do you not have the dump button in RT, you know, the nine second delay when someone swears? No, we don't. No, you, you know we that. We do. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, Pat, I wish we did. <laughs> Could have saved a few bob over yeah. the years. I tell you, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But actually, like, but that is the key. That is the beauty yeah. of radio. Yeah. It's that it's it's why people and why Irish people particularly uh, consume radio in such huge numbers is because it's live, it's immediate, it's your own people talking about your own stories, your own country. It's it's local and it's national, um, and it's real. Okay, uh, it, it doesn't, and we haven't asked you to address the question of funding yet. We will in a moment. We'll go to Celine. How do you see, based on all your European observations and the studies that have been done, many of them in Europe, about the, the future of radio, how do you see it? I think, like the, the Jim and, and Roddy, I, I think there's definitely a future for radio. It's been an extraordinarily resilient medium. I think what is required perhaps is to think about what those strengths are that radio has. So it's, it's personal, it's, it, there's a companionship element to it, it's a trusted source of news and current affairs. It's trying to do what it do, does well, take those kind of features and find perhaps a new expression in, in, in reaching young people um, online. So it is about finding new means through, through that link with online. It's, it's really around perhaps reconceiving the business, which is perhaps seeing radio as you know, a digital audio content business and how that, you know, how they, it can take what it does very well and find new expression in that in new and newer environment. We'll talk about uh, delivery methods in a moment mm. and how people access their, uh, their, their choice of listening. Willie, where do you see the future? Simply, I, I agree with what everybody has said, but I believe the future is secure because, as you said, I've worked in many aspects of this uh, industry. I've met the younger people in it, Pat. They're hugely enthusiastic, and dare I say it, they're as bright as you were, uh, sorry, are, <laughs> and I was, and I think they will take that torch and carry it, and that's what I see with my own eyes. In an attempt to kind of crystallise it, I was driving around yesterday, I listened to LMFM, I heard Ray Kelly come on and talk about the abuse he got, later picked up on Joe Duffy's show. Uh, on our own show, uh, an iRadio, our afternoon presenter had been clamped, 
but he had put a ticket in the car, but he put it in the rear window, seemingly at loan, that's not okay. And this was a big part of what was going on on the show. Sean Moncrief was talking about a man who was living on a diet of pigeons. I was thinking, where would you get that richness, <laughs> apart from the political news, you won't get that on social media. And because I was driving, I couldn't consume social media or television. And my last point is, we shouldn't think we're alone. Pat, all media is challenged. It's been a bad year for TV. Uh, Virgin Media is letting some people go. They have their challenges. In the digital sphere, while Google and Facebook certainly are pushing ahead and taking up all the growth, some of the other players are having issues as well. So radio shouldn't think it's alone. The, the pie, that revenue pie has been cut more and more, and so other people are feeling okay. that tightness we'll as well. We'll come to the, the revenue and how you make it uh, pay in a moment or two, but methods of delivery. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning, I was listening on a crystal set to the medium wave, but also the long wave, you might get some European station on yeah. your valve radio and so on. Then it moved on to, um, well, the short wave is always there and is still there, strangely enough, for uh, BBC. Um, but you move on then to FM, FM, the frequency modulation, mm -hmm. and finally, to, to DAB and then to streaming, which is the digital as well as well, DAB. Well, can I help How you here? Are we, going Just, to get we haven't got to DAB, and that's an interesting thing that we need to discuss. A little bit of history here. Back in about 2001, I was part of a group in the IBI who commissioned research from Ernst & Young, as they were then called, which kind of put DAB on the back burner because we weren't sure what was going to happen. Then happened the recession, changes in consumption. But I've watched what's happened in the UK with the rollout of DAB Plus, and it has excited the industry. RTE has a DAB network, a small one, and I think we need to go back in a structured way with input from the BAI and the department and look on that because actually, the key, and my last sentence is, it's the adaptability of radio that secures its future. Okay, Celine, what about the DAB, DAB Plus? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the push to use DAB uh, sometimes, and I think in the case of the Nordics, comes from they have an alternative use for the FM frequencies, yeah. valuable frequencies which they can deploy elsewhere. Therefore, you can cram 20 stations on, on a DAB network. That's brilliant. And therefore, you can make money from the rest. What does that mean in an Irish context? I think DAB, uh, we, the BAI has been quite a number of years, I mean, I, I think probably the guts of 20 years, going back 20 years, we were trying to get some traction in relation to, to, to DAB at that time. And uh, it was via the licensing process with, you know, with the promise of potentially an extended contract. And we found it very, very difficult to get, to get, to get any traction. But one of the things I really wanted to say here today was to really challenge the sector to start thinking again about DAB+. Plus. There was a recent EBU report just published in January that covered the EBU area. It wasn't confined to public service broadcasters. But there's up almost 1,700 uh, DAB plus, uh, sorry, digital uh, terrestrial um, radio services right across the European Union areas and, and, and beyond that. And the really interesting thing is that two thirds of those are actually commercial services. And another really extraordinary fact, which might surprise some people here, is that two thirds of those are of a local and regional nature as well. And what you're saying, small audiences uh, can afford DAB? Well, I think obviously the funding of DAB has to be looked at, but it's certainly a way to innovate and I think you know, innovation is always the, the key in a way to, to try to ensure resilience and, and future, you know, future, future life, if you like. Um, so I think it's really important that, that if that's working elsewhere in Europe, and it does, it's taken quite a while, but now that it seems to be working successfully, okay, that, it's something that to revisit here in Ireland. About the spectrum that would be freed up yeah. um, with the FM spectrum. Uh, surrendering to DAB after how many years of transition, mm. what would that FM spectrum be used for? I don't think there's th that people have really identified a, a very sort of compelling use of that freed up FM spectrum. But I think there's some advantage in that at this stage mm. because it would allow the possibility of simulcasting on FM and on, on, on DAB yeah. plus at the same time, which would allow some of yeah. that transition. I'll, I'll come to, to Jim in a moment about DAB and DAB plus and the expense. Roddy, what's your take on? the future method of delivery. Should it be DAB? I, I, I won't let you, I'm not an expert on DAB, and, but I'm struck by the fact that RTE thought that one of the first things, one of the first responses to the kind of cutbacks was, well, we'll just stop the DAB stations, which was 
not exactly a you know a, a vote in its its favour. I mean, I but I'm also struck that by the fact that 85% of people who are listening to audio content are still listening to live radio as opposed to, for example, podcasts or streams. So. Well, I mean, I was struck by Michael's point at the start. You, you, you may we live an interesting, may you live in interesting times, I think is the quote. And the implication there is that interesting means terrible, right? Um, but they've been less interesting in that respect, actually, I think, for radio than they have been for other kind of media. Because while, whilst you know, you've seen, uh, in terms of newspapers, collapse in sales there, television faces real kind of challenges from the online equivalent, I suppose, of, of, of something like that, so streaming services and Netflix. Yeah. I don't see that being quite as significant a challenge for radio because podcasting is not the same as broadcasting. It's a different form and it performs yeah. different and functions. And you'll never listen to a podcast of the match between Liverpool and Manchester United. <laughs> you know, who bothers? Yeah. Um, whereas you might listen to a drama or a documentary series or whatever. Jim, this whole question of DAB, I mean, you're in possession of a, a DAB network. And for those of us who are not too familiar with the difference between DAB and DAB Plus. Well, there are, there are, there are a number of multiplexes. Um, uh, Celine can correct me if I'm wrong, but there were four multiplex licenses um, put up for, um, um, for debate yep. uh, well, 10 years ago. Um, RTE took two of them. There were two available for the commercial sector. Nobody in the commercial sector was interested in DAB. Um, and we have tried, we have been on a trial on DAB for the last 10 years. Uh, and it's been called a trial. Um, and uh, we have tried on a number of occasions to get uh, the commercial sector and independent radio to partner with us in DAB, and we've had no takers. Um, and we've had debates within various committees mm -hmm. um, um, uh, about this. And there comes a point where if the industry isn't going to invent, invest in DAB, and if the state and the state aren't going to invest in the infrastructure, uh, we currently have uh, rolled out an infrastructure that covers 55% of the country, which is mainly the motor, motorways yeah. and Dublin, Cork and Limerick. Yeah. Um, um, and the, the investment that's needed to actually fill out that uh, network to make it viable is considerable. Um, and, and that's the cost of entry then for commercial... It is commercial. the cost of entry. And yeah. our experience, and you, you mentioned, I just mentioned it to, to Willie, because Willie was on the board of RTE when this happened. When we got into DTT, we had a similar issue with DTT. RTE was told, because RTE had to build the infrastructure for DAB, we had to, we had to pay for it, the state didn't pay for it. Uh, similarly with DTT, RTE had to pay the bill for DTT, it cost us 50 million, 60 million. At least. Um, we had to take out a loan on that, and, and the government sold the space, the freed up space, for hundreds of millions. Yep. Um, and RTE did not get a beam. We still have the debt, we are still servicing that to debt today in RTE for the establishment of the DT, of this, DTT. This reminds me, I can go back when uh, RT owned part of Cablelink. Yeah. Mm. And we had a, a bidding process. I was on the board of RT at the time. We had a bidding process to see who'd, who'd buy it, buy RT's share. And there was an American investor going to come in and pay real foreign American dollars for a whack of Cablelink, for all of RT's share of Cablelink. And um, RT was ordered by Ray Burke to sell it to one post. Or to, to Aircom, rather. Mm -hmm. so you uh, which RT did, and then Ray Burke took the money. So, so you can see I some mean, of the challenges. This kind of back. stuff goes on all the time, which is you, shocking. You can see some of the challenges, though. Why, and, and why people in this room would say to me, well, why, hold on, why are we going to invest our money in this if the state aren't going to uh, invest in, in the infrastructure? If they're not going to uh, help us in building an infrastructure which is going to free up um, uh, space for um, um, multinational. Okay, but, which but is here, what here's, the, so, here's the question. Um, people will say, we have an FM signal. It's fine, thank you very much. Yeah. Why do we need to invest in something that gives, some people would say it's a less hi-fi than, um, than the FM uh, stereo signal. Yeah. I don't know, I'm not going to argue about that. But why should we fix something that ain't broken? Well, my, my answer is simple, is that we are importing 100,000 cars every year from the UK. Many people in this room are driving them. They all come with DAB radios. Do so they get DAB and DAB Plus? Yeah, it's or going to be is it specific to one kind of digital transmission. Again, I think that's a technical question, and I wouldn't presume to have the answer. But what you normally have is a structured way of, of looking at this. I was fortunate enough to sit on the board that had to look at the arrival of DTT, and there was a quick solution, which was to go to MPEG2 compression. There's the science bit 
because the UK had adopted that. And we took a deliberate decision to go for MPEG-4 because it was European, more expensive, but it was future-proofed. And I was part of that process with the department, the BAI, and other stakeholders, and we came to a really mature decision for the whole industry. And that's the way we need to do it. I'm not sure we can answer all those questions in this but room. The we can debate is, why, them. Why fix something that ain't broken? There's two, there's two points about the car, which is interesting. From next year, all cars coming into this country, new cars, will have to have DAB, OK? But also, which is the other interesting thing, 95% of new cars produced in Europe will also have, will also be connected. So they'll also have Apple Play and they'll also yes. have um, Android Auto. So the question that you have to ask yourself, this is a complex uh, um, um, situation, is like your daughter. When your daughter sits into the car and she's got her iPhone with her, it'll automatically collect to um, Apple um, uh, Play in your CarPlay. So she will be able to, whether she wants to do Spotify, or listen to her songs, or live radio, or whatever, instantly. So the question you have to ask is, what is the value of that? Where is this going to go in terms of the audience? Audience first. Is it going to be DAB? Are you going to get into your car and it's going to have an FM button, and DAB button, and yeah. uh, Apple? Probably it's going to have Apple first. So this is the huge debate, and it's a battle for radio to be on the dashboard in the car, mm -hmm. and it's a battle that we have to fight in this country, because if we want radio to succeed, radio has to be front and centre and in, the, in people's minds. Celine? Yeah, I, I think it's important as well not Welcome. to see it as just transferring the service in the area that it's in onto a DAB signal. I, I think it's really important to see it beyond that. There's, there's again, I'm not, not being in the broadcasting business, but certainly all we hear is that there's real opportunities to innovate around um, once you're in that DAB, you're broadcasting on the DAB plus, um, on, on, on the DAB, DAB plus, uh, using DAB plus technology. So I think given that there's now quite a body, a very significant body of experience, say all throughout Europe and, and as well in the UK, I think it's important to, you know, if Ireland is looking to see one, what it should do in terms of the technology going forward, but also what those opportunities might be. There's a real chance to take a wider okay, look at what, what's been successful What in are those opportunities? Just spell them out if you, if you can. As I understand it, it's, a lot of it is around repackaging content and putting it out in different ways. That's, I mean, you're, you're right in saying nobody's going to listen to, to well, a podcast. I, 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 I of know the thing that I happened. like about DAB, yeah. if the phone rings, I can pause and then I can resume where I left off. Because mm -hmm. the irritation when some, you're listening to something on the radio that you really want to hear and the phone rings. Mm. Uh, and you know, the phone is more compelling, so you have to answer the damn phone. But that is one thing, okay. But Again, looking aspects. at the, the uh, it, would, it would have to be reconfigured, but looking at the kind of the geographic reach of some services, you know, there's also some potential uh, to, to- But you're saying that to, any to extend regional station reach. would be competing nationwide? That's one possibility. Local services could be competing on a regional basis. So there's other configurations. National stations compete already, yeah. mm. um, but you're now inviting, therefore, by this, all the local stations. Pat, to can eat I the say something on that? Stations lunch. Can I say something? No, I, I think you're wrong because the configuration of it will be national and regional. I'm going to embarrass a couple of people in the room, and if it's slightly wrong, you know me, so my apologies. I see Eamon Bustle here. I'm sure there's somebody from WLR. Back in 2000, when we spoke about this, they said there's no way we're having this. We don't want Southeast Radio coming into our franchise yeah. area in WLR. And then somewhere down the road, they got over that because they realized that a WLR listener, whether they're in North Munster or North Leinster, actually will, will be delighted to hear it on the DAB, but the locals won't tune in because people are loyal to their region. So I see a multiplex across the country which has more stations on national, and then a lot of the local stations, say WLR and SE, I'm talking about Southeast Radio, have an enhanced franchise yeah. area. Yeah. That's the first key geographical okay. structural change. Jim? So does it, does it have international stations on it? It can have, if they came along, look, Radio France, if you so want those. There's an issue for everybody in this room, I think. If uh, Talk Sport wanted to come along mm -hmm. and occupy a position on a DAB a multiplex and compete with all our stations, how would we feel about that? Well, no, We've seen it in television. Sort of Brexit has sorted that out. We don't have to worry about <laughs> okay. that. Well, what, or, or Five Live, for example. Five Live, yeah. 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 Like, you know, how would we feel about that? Like, we have it in television where we have over 60 opt-out stations taking our advertising uh, out of the country to the UK. How would we feel if, if that happened? 
Well, I think if it enriches radio, right, and if it conforms to the regulations of the country, that's Celine's job, then I think it's okay. Yeah, licensing regime could, you know, examine those, look at some of those possibilities. Okay, that, would there presume, have to be a licensing strategy to accompany I presume it? DAB and the network you construct could be very fine-tuned to uh, allow signals only in certain places. Oh, yeah, DAB Plus, actually, that is what it can do. It's very light. You can actually have a DAB Plus... Um, 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 uh, broadcaster like on the top of a building you, it, it is quite defined in terms of what it does you can limit to where it broadcasts okay. it Roddy do you have thoughts on, yeah, on I this? Because I'm, I'm just thinking about the difference between radio and television like historically again in this country so you know, RTE from its inception relied on important content and they did it for com commercial reasons much as anything else they couldn't afford to kind of produce their own stuff but that's been the nature of television it's been international medium for a long time and I do stuff on kind of media ownership, media pluralism in this country, and so I'm always been asked questions about where does the content come from for Irish television, and the answer is, well, actually, numerically, the bulk of it comes from overseas. Then I'm asked the same question about radio, and it's 100% local, I mean, more, more or less. And the idea that somehow, because suddenly, I mean, BBC has been available de facto in this country through long wave or short wave, or whatever means you want to talk about, forever, right, since mm -hmm. 1922. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people listen to it. They've never listened to yeah. it in substantial numbers. But Roddy, I mean, but it's, I, the, it's I the local to, nature that, that's significant. I, I listen to Five Live in my car sometimes if there's a commentary on, I want to hear 909 on the meeting wave. A really lousy signal. I will suffer through it to yeah. hopefully hear Man United score. But, you know, that doesn't often happen. Doesn't often days. happen. Does. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but uh, if it's suddenly hi-fi uh, mm. on my dab signal in my car, Different picture. Pat, can I tell you, that's not easy. I've done the rights. The notion that TalkSport would have the rights for commentary for Ireland, along with the UK. So the, it's not quite as easy. You don't just take the radio station yeah. and plug it in. Mm. There are other rights issues as well. Yeah. Now, yeah. one of the things that struck me, um, I, I was bemoaning the lack of a headphone jack on the latest generation of uh, mobile phones. And Samsung have finally given in. The, the S20 now mm -hmm. does not have a headphone jack. So you have to go Bluetooth. And the reason I wanted the headphone jack was, well, they actually cut off FM as well about another generation ago, right. is because streaming is imperfect. You know, I'm walking the dogs up Kalini Hill and I lose my mobile phone signal, but I always had my FM signal. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is, um, until you start taking stuff away, people don't necessarily know how much they cherish it. So you try switching off the that as RT had long the long wave signal yeah. in, yeah. in the, the UK. Well, it's not turned off, by the way. No. Yeah. <laughs> but try switching it off, and yeah. you see what happens. Anyone, any observations on that, that you might have to live in a parallel and therefore more expensive technical universe for quite a well, while? Well, that's what's happened in the UK. FM is still alive and well living in the UK. When I worked for EMAP back in the day, I traveled over to Scotland. Medium wave is still alive in the UK, but then there's whatever, 65 million people, it's, there's, there's bigger reach on those services. We've, we uniquely have left medium wave behind and we'd love, sorry, to leave long wave behind. The question is, are we going to be an FM only country or FM and IP, or is there some kind of intermediary to, to technology or something else that the public will adopt quickly? Okay, now question for Celine really about 5G. Um, those who've experienced 5G, downloading a movie in a matter of seconds, mm -hmm. which is phenomenal download speeds. Equally, we know multiplicity of mass to deliver a comprehensive 5G, so it won't necessarily be everywhere. But the kind of talk that in 10 years' time with 5G, pretty universal, that you wouldn't need radio licenses anymore. Everything could be done through 5G. Your thoughts? I think that is some way off. Um, I, I think we, I think this, the industry needs to think a little bit more in the, the nearer term, while obviously keeping an eye on, on what some of those longer term developments are. I think they're still awaiting a kind of killer application really for 5G. I, you know, I, I don't know that there's automatically um, anything in, in, in mind in, in, in terms of replacing existing uh, broadcasting services. Um, but I do think that willingness to move and really consider and engage with, with technology more generally is what the sector as a whole needs to be really tracking and, and, and keeping an eye on. 
probably some of those 5G developments are going to be happening elsewhere before they're going to come on stream here. Some of the, the 5G spectrum has been auctioned off long before now in, in, in other European states. So I think it's important to see what applications that has. If it has applications that are relevant to traditional broadcasting media, then I think that's the kind of thing that needs to be tracked and developed. Uh, th there's a, a more philosophical question, but a practical one at the same time, which any of you uh, can address. And that is 5G or 4G or streaming generally is far less energy efficient than broadcasting. Broadcasting is massively energy efficient. Mm -hmm. You can have millions of people tuning in on whatever device they want to tune in on from one signal mm. from a local mast or whatever. Uh, if everyone's going to be streaming, everyone's going to be consuming vast amounts of power. Is that really the way to go into the future? I don't think it's a good idea, Pat, if I take it up first. And secondly, we're very lucky at the moment because of net neutrality. So whatever you put down the pipe is treated equally. What if it isn't treated equally? What if the people who own the distribution networks put radio as a low priority? My advice is simple, own the distribution network. It works everywhere else. So owning FM and owning DAB is really important. Don't become an IP only service. You need late, additional latency for your signal, but you also need a robust secondary, whichever you view as secondary, a, a robust backup service for your distribution. Jim, there's, there's another issue with IP as well, which is data protection. So, um, you know, uh, nobody can trace you on FM uh, mm -hmm. or on DAB Plus, but actually there's a whole issue around data protection. We know IP. what you've been listening to. <laughs> yeah, no, but there is, like, you know, so, um, um, you know, I think people would need to consider that as well. And also congestion is going to be a huge issue for 5G. I think 5G is a long way away. I think uh, FM is an absolutely superb uh, method of broadcasting. It's robust. It's seen off, um, you know, uh, other pretenders in the past. It'll still be here in 10 years' time, Pat. But, but, but I mean, we're being a bit holier than yeah. thou in terms mm -hmm. of the IP and the information that mm -hmm. can be uh, derived from knowing what you listen to. I mean, if you're a radio station and you know that people love hearing about pot noodles because yeah. that's what your uh, internet intelligence tells you, then you can go to the pot noodle people and say, listen, I tell you, if you listen to this show, and put your pot noodles, you'll sell oodles of noodles. <laughs> but, so, uh, did but you also, rehearse but, this? Yeah, that works the other way though, Pat, as well. So you're driving to Woody's. The, the, the radio station will know that you're driving to Woody's. I want to send you an ad before when you're five minutes away from Woody's saying, drop into Woody's. Um, or whatever. So there's that part of it as well. They will know where you are, where you're going. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a whole issue then about uh, d directional advertising, uh, personal advertising. Targeted advertising. Yep. Yeah, which broadcasts cannot do. I mean, it's... But you will be able ads. to do with 5G. With 5G, you'd be able to tailor the ads? You will, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, you could have them digitally inserted into yeah. the stream in the same way that the UK television stations already do it yeah. here. Okay. Do you have thoughts on this? Well, it's just it's the principle of you know, cellular networking that obviously it relies on the fact that you can identify to the nearest sometimes 100 metres, sometimes to the nearest shop, what, what location you're in. So there are kind of real kind of issues there. On the other hand, um, and the, uh, the case of, uh, someone will remind me, uh, the, the one that looked at basically the use of mobile phone data, Thank you. Graham Guire um, in the last week has raised you know, questions about the legality um, of that. In fact, it hasn't raised questions about the legality of that. It's established that that's not a legal use yeah. of that kind of data. So you've, there's a distinction, I suppose, between, on the one hand, what is technically possible and what is legally permissible. Um, so that's kind of up in the air as well. Okay. But your point, just very quickly, about um, kind of use of energy. If there's, an, if there's ever a case for a natural monopoly, it's in a distribution system, because it's not just that you'll have 5G, which is more inefficient than, uh, than FM, you'll have three 5G networks, right? Because you've got three players operating in the, in the country simultaneously. They share some of their, um, their masts occasionally, but for the most part, they are setting up their own system. So it's triply wasteful, if you like. Okay, um, I will be opening it to the floor, so if you've got questions that are bubbling under, we'll take them in a few minutes' time. Um, the, the last main area I want to talk about is, is uh, content and what people are going to want to listen to that is unique to radio rather than simply um, podcasts or other digital feeds. So, Willie, what are people going to listen to? Oh, 
You got me on that. I think you should have gone to Jim first. But I'll take a step. Okay, I'll go to Jim. You go to Jim yeah. first. <laughs> look, look, our strategy in this part is that, like we have we have um, moved to a content-led strategy for broadcasting, mm -hmm. which is all about the program first, the station first, the content first. So it's all about national is local. It's all about here and now and us. And live wins. Live is 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 the king of content in terms of particularly when it comes to advertising. So, you know, that's why I think radio is so robust. That's why all the re research done in America says that advertising works better on radio than any other medium, mm -hmm. because for that very reason. So, um, you know, it's, for me, it is local, uh, live, and uh, our stories told by our people. That's what will persevere, no matter what the uh, multinationals do, no what the other, what, what the other stations do, and that's why, you know, um, WLR or any local station shouldn't be worried about what their neighbour is doing because actually it's about brand mm -hmm. uh, Loyalty. affinity. It's about what you do for your listeners. That's the really the most. But important. also, if something fantastic happens, like the man eating pigeons, or yeah. um, Father Ray Kelly being attacked on Liveline yesterday, yeah. mm -hmm. which was hugely entertaining mm -hmm. as well. Um, you'll always be able to podcast those things uh, later. If, yeah. you, if, if yeah. everyone's buzzing about something, yeah. mm -hmm. you'll be able to podcast it later. Celine? But, but I think, yeah, you have to add to, to what Jim has already said by saying, you know, that um, Irish radio, public service and commercial is a really trusted source of news yeah. and current affairs. And, you know, that's something that I think the industry can really leverage going forward. Um, it, and I, I think, Brother, you'll, you'll yeah. will be familiar with the, the Reuters research that positions uh, traditional forms of Irish media, rates them very, very highly in relation to public trust. Uh, RTE, our commercial services, they consistently um, are the main sources of online uh, news and current affairs. And that comes from that trust that people have in the medium. I think it's something which absolutely has to be leveraged going forward. And I'd add one, one other thing, which I think in the BAI we'd be very keen for um, broadcasting here to take up, is to start really thinking a lot more in terms of diversity. Um, not just diversity in terms of the content that's put out there and what people hear or see on their screens, but real diversity within the services themselves in terms of the people who present, in terms of uh, the people who research and are contributors uh, to, to, to content. They really have to, to start looking at real diversity in our society to a much greater extent. But do you think that there are communities in Ireland, and particularly, I suppose, in the urban areas, who are not served at all by radio? Well, uh, they may be served, but, you know, are, is, it, is it tailored in any way for them, or is there a sense that it reflects their lives, their realities, their identities? I think that's the question that needs to be asked, and I think it is a challenge that I, I, I think Irish media could raise to, mm. uh, they could raise the bar in that one, I think. Um, mm. I, I think I mean, it's something I, to really think about. You know, this uh, complete, uh, the big debate in whether or not integration or you know, uh, honouring uh, people's culture by maybe giving them their own radio station and whether that's the way to go or whether by osmosis that mm. the immigrant communities start to feed into existing <coughs> services, be it radio or television. I mean, again, going to Liveline, Joe is not short of people from diverse backgrounds phoning in. No. Not at all. They recognise a service when they hear it in their taxi. Yeah, and I'm not saying it's, it's not there at all. I, I think it just needs to be more complete. It needs to be behind the microphone, in front of the microphone. You know, it needs to be, if it's, if it's there in the makeup of the services, in, in the, the, the staff of the services, it will start to get reflected yeah. to a much greater extent. I'm not be, saying it's not being served. You have to be aware of tokenism, because absolutely, yeah. uh, that, that yeah. is a pitfall that is all too evident. Will I it? think those two things, that, you know, to add to it, relevance and trustworthy are, are worth exploring. So, you know, I grew up listening to the Gay Byrne Show. I became the producer of the Jerry Ryan Show. I put Gay or I put Ray Darcy on Today FM. And in all of that pattern, what I heard was an audience talking to itself through a moderator about their life's experience. So I think it's important that we retain that, that the new services have some element of that. They will undoubtedly have sports and music and all the bits and pieces. But we need to have that as the core offering of what we do, because that's where we earn the trust of the public. And actually, it was interesting your story about your daughter listening in the car, because she got a push notification. And so often we find that you know, kids and ourselves get the push notification, and then we put on the 6-1 news, or we put on news talk to see if it's really true. We yeah. need to guard that, that trust we have with yeah. the public.
Roddy? I mean, just two things. I've just uh, Tomorrow I'm going to hit enter and hit send on a thing called the Media Pluralism Monitor, which is, this is the third iteration of it. It asks 200 questions about media pluralism in Ireland. One of them is about um, access of minorities and gives a number of definitions for that. It's the single highest uh, risk factor identified in the research. It's like way above anything else. Um, I take your point about maybe through osmosis, but I mean, it's one thing creating a space where people can possibly you know, ring up Joe, talk to Joe. It's a different thing though having those faces, for example, kind of integrated into, into Irish broadcasting or those voices. How often do you hear an accent on, if you walk through your local Tesco, you'll hear those accents, right? I, I don't hear those accents on Irish radio. And I'll, I'll preface that those ways as saying that I mainly listen to national radio, so maybe it's available in kind of local radio around the country somewhere. But as, as I, a I producer of a radio program, and uh, you know, I have some involvement in the production sure. of uh, radio shows over the years, but both Jim and uh, Willie certainly uh, have. I mean, we've all heard the Russian ambassador interviewed through a translator, <laughs> and it's turn off radio. So, you know, it's one thing to say we must have diversity, but if it is not of interest to the audience that are paying, you know, through their presence and therefore JNLRs and advertising, Producers are not going to do it. They're not. Fifteen percent to... of the Irish population is not traditionally Irish. Yeah, but the, so that fifteen percent no, is, is not seeing themselves. They're not reflected. uniform. Well, you know, it's not like saying there's the fifteen percent Brits and eighty-five percent Irish. No, there might be eighty-five percent Irish and there's fifteen percent Romanian, Lithuanian, Lithuanian, Polish, African, Asian. That, okay, with so, respect, 50,000 50, people speak Irish on a daily basis in this country, and yet the, the kind of the resources that are put into that. Are, Jim, massively take in excess, are massively in excess uh, uh, of, no. the, of the audience for that. I, I'm we do with, it anyway, because yeah. we think it's important. Yeah, I'm with, I, actually, I'm with Roddy on this. Like, you know, we've struggled with this on RT um, um, over the years uh, for all those reasons that you say. Um, we are really putting a huge effort into getting as many diverse voices on air in, in, in everyday programming. The most successful program, funny enough, that does that is Drive Time. You'll hear it regularly in Drive Time. Um, different voices and different people. It's a struggle to get producers, because producers have, some of them have the same sort of, um, or would express the same sort of views, Pat, that you do. But actually, it's about actually, uh, I agree with Roddy, it's about reflecting who we are. And if you really do want to have young contemporary audiences, and if you really do want to reflect the demographics in the country, and demographics is a key issue for us in radio in terms of the age profile and, uh, of people who listen to our services, you have to do it, and you have to find those people. And it's not about actually their accent, it's about what they're talking about. And they're talking about the same issues as you and I are talking about every day, whether it's the politics, who's in government, who's gonna be elected to, uh, like, it, it, it takes a bit of effort, Pat, but it actually, you will see results in it, because the worst thing you can have is you have a radio program or a radio station that people say, that's not for me, because I don't hear anybody on there that is the same as me. It should be about uh, really? Everything. Yeah, just one thing. We're, we're, you know, I agree with all of this. We're probably stuck, Pat. I'm thinking about your question, that we have a model that we know very well, and it's hard to box out of it. And I was thinking, what other models have I heard about? And so in Holland, one of the things you can do is you can buy time on the radio. So for instance, in this country, I'll be provocative. How come Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael and even Sinn Féin can't have their own radio shows? What if in the multiplex, <laughs> which regulate, <laughs> Pat? <laughs> It was for their community. Who's going to listen to it anyway? But, <laughs> when it's unmoderated. Why, co why, 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 why couldn't time, the Irish not, Cancer really, Society... Really, there was a time when RT was viewed as the station of the Workers' yeah. Party, so... Yeah. <laughs> why couldn't the Irish Cancer Society, or indeed the Alzheimer's Society, have two hours on a Thursday evening on a national multiplex station where they talk to their community? Now, sorry, I'm just get, I'm, But I think what you see, we're, we're bound by thinking about the past. You're saying where we go in the future. It's hard to make that jump. But there are other structures when there's more frequencies and outputs available that may, that may serve other functions that we wish to serve okay. indeed communities. So, so we've looked at the way the signals might be distributed and what the options are. We've looked at the kind of content that people would like and where radio does deliver, and, and that is in terms of live sport, for instance, mm -hmm. breaking news, uh, people talking about themselves to each other, uh, live line programs and all the, the phone in programs, all of that, that's great. The question is, can it be funded? And that is the imponderable, because at the moment, RTE obviously is in receipt of uh, license fee money, but 
we don't know where that is going. We're looking at a debate nervously across the channel at what Boris might do to the BBC. So we don't know what new models might be proposed there and whom on this island might get excited by that prospect. Jim? Yeah, look, you know, uh, there's a huge debate and I think everybody who wants to be involved in that debate in this room should be involved in it when this commission um, uh, eventually sits, if it sits. Uh, myself and Celine were talking about it earlier on. Mm. But there's an opportunity now to actually debate what, you know, what broadcasting in Ireland looks like um, uh, and how it's funded. I um, mean, our argument would be that, you know, um, you know the uh, uh, lack of efficiency in the license collection in Ireland is uh, criminal in the sense that the amount of money that is allowed, no other tax would, uh, would, al would be allowed to be unpaid to the same extent as the license fee is. And then there's a debate that if you do collect it efficiently, how that is divided up and who gets a piece of that uh, license fee. And that's where the debate should be. We should fix the license fee and collect on the money and then have a debate about actually who gets what. Because there's, a, there's an argument and a, a cogent argument to be made that actually lots of broadcasters should get access to a license fee in various different... Yeah. Uh, in, in any event, the solution to the license fee is very apparent, but no one bites the bullet. Yeah. Uh, you know, collect it through the utility. Yeah. You can't charge your phone, you can't charge your laptop, you can't run your telly without an, uh, an electricity They did that supplier. in Italy and overnight it was solved. Yeah. So yeah. the solution is there. We'll probably go around the houses uh, in order to reach the final uh, resting point. Do you have a view on that? Uh, well, we've gone, I mean, we've gone around the houses several times, haven't we? I mean, this is, yeah. this, yeah. It's going to be difficult, Pat, because we know roughly what the size of the radio advertising market is. If you include direct local, it's probably about 130, 140. It ain't growing, right? Uh, we've, there's been some very bad practices in it. People have been selling their inventory far too cheaply. They haven't valued what they have. They keep beating beaten up by the digital arguments. Uh, perhaps those things need to change, and I advocate them for them generally. Maybe in terms of the structure, back to your big question about the future, maybe there should be more networking program across local radio. Maybe, maybe, maybe local radio is defined by what it does between seven in the morning and seven in the evening, and we could have network programs after that. They did that in the UK. And, and I'm going back to your question, and I hadn't really thought about it. What are the changes that we can do to the system that don't undermine it, but free up perhaps cash and resources to do things so that we can adopt for the future? OK, questions. I'm sure people are, have lots of ideas on what they'd like to ask. Have you ever come across such a shy room of broadcasters <laughs> who haven't a word to say? Come on. Yeah, question there. We'll get a microphone to you. If we can, there are floating mics around. I just want to ask the panel about uh, Irish language. You're talking about the importance of reflecting our demographic and recently uh, commercial stations, particularly youth stations, come in for a lot of criticism about being a tokenistic approach to Irish language and you know, it's important to reflect society. Just interested to hear the panel's thoughts on, on whether commercials should be doing more. Okay, I suppose you're the I'll commercial take. voice um, <laughs> at the moment, Willie. Okay, I, I have to be careful. I get incandescent at this stage, right? <laughs> okay, and here, I, I'll do it quite simply. i pick up on something Roddy said. An entire national FM network is given to Radio and the Gwail Talk. And less people listen to Radio and the Gwail Talk over a, an entire 24 hours than listen to in 15 minutes on the iRadio breakfast show. How crazy is that? It's not about servicing I I Irish Gwelgors or, or whatever it is. It's about an incredible disproportionate uh, and inefficient allocation of resources. I'm not arguing against it, but I think but the question that needs to be looked at. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Willie, Willie, here's the question. If, if, yes, they, if they put the other national network, uh, RNG, up for grabs, yep. would you in iRadio be willing to put out much more Irish language programming. Well, uh, we'd love to bid for it. We'd certainly be interested in going for that network. There's no doubt No, about it's the that. quid pro quo I'm talking about, putting out lots of clárlacha as during the day, prime time, yeah. in exchange for a national Well, network. I think, I think Radio and the Gael could be better serviced being on DAB or being on an IP <laughs> station or with some relevant FM transmitters around the, the country. Why does it have a stereo network? Most of it's, in, it's, it's, it's just conversation. Jim? Like, like news talk. Jim? Um, you know, I, um, um, I, I said this publicly at another forum, actually on the Rock This Committee, uh, when I was asked this question, um, um, and I've never said it um, uh, to Celine, but 
We spend in Ireland about 65 million on Irish language broadcasting, uh, funded by the state, whether it's through TG Car, Radio the Gaeltacht, or um, through sound and vision applications. And you have to ask yourself the question, is that 65 million well spent uh, in terms of, is it doing what it's supposed to do in terms of the Irish language and the quality of programmes uh, that it does. We, have, we haven't had a debate about Irish language broadcasting in this country, in my memory, for, I don't know, 20 years, 30 mm -hmm. years, uh, about, which, about the way we should do it. Um, we got involved in a spat, not a spat, we got involved in a uh, complaint <laughs> with, um, with the uh, Commissioner Chonga uh, in terms of our output. Um, and the Commissioner Chonga, um, which is the Irish language commissioner, issued a report saying there should be uh, equivalence in Irish language and English language broadcasting on RT, i.e., when I asked him, 50%. Like, that is ridiculous, to be quite frankly, you know. And if we're spending this amount of money on Irish language broadcasting and they believe that that's not enough, mm. I think there really is, it really is time for a debate about Irish language broadcasting in this country, what it's supposed to do, and how it's funded. Okay, so. Yeah, I, I think it's certainly valid to have Irish language content available via broadcast services. Um, BAI would be very strongly supportive of that in terms of diversity and recognising that it might be, a, they may be small in number, but it's a very important part of, of a lot of much, people's Irish identity. I mean, uh, going back to Roddy's point about <coughs> diversity, um, how many people are true Gael Gordy who speak la the language every day and who have little enough or poor comprehension of, of English? You're spending an awful lot of money there. I mean, do you do the same for the new Irish proportionately to get them up to speed? I don't know. It's, uh, uh, Irish language is, is one of the, the, the recognised, the two recognised language in the state. So I think it, it does have a special uh, status um, in Ireland that has to be acknowledged and recognised. I think in, from a BAI perspective in terms of commercial services, we've always tried to take a reasonable approach, recognising that a lot of public funding goes into funding, Radio Nagel Tukta and Tiji Cahar. Um, so in that sense, we've been realistic about the expectations of what commercial services might be expected to do, expecting a little bit more in, in areas where there's a, a, a Gael Tukta. What I do think might there might be some benefit from at some stages looking at that debate about how money is spent and allocated and, and also looking at how more can be leveraged about yeah. that. And that's a much wider industry debate. It, it does really require public sector. There may be more value that can be created from the money that, for example, is going into public service uh, broadcasting. And I think, you know, it is around public service broadcasters and commercial broadcasters really sitting down and, and, okay. and teasing Rather. that one out. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of cognitive dissonance about this. On the one level, I think Irish language is part of our culture, our identity, all of that. I'd be, I'd be terrified of the, the, the idea that it sort of disappears. But it's disappeared in some respects. I mean, that, that thing has happened to, to, to a large extent. We send our children to school for 12 years. They learn Irish. The vast majority of the day the Leaving Cert is finished, it might be the last time they use Irish in any meaningful way again. So there's a much broader conversation there, I suppose, about you know, the role of Irish language yeah. and the resources that are dedicated to it and whether that can be done better. My general feeling is that um, the manner in which... Um, actually, I think TG Cahar got it better than pretty, pretty much anywhere else in that it talked about that thing of, that Sulela language, oh, you know, mm. uh, that we see things differently and that a language is a way of kind of, you know, seeing yeah. kind of reality differently. But I, I also think that, that, those, that some of those resources could be much better yeah. But, but there's an element elsewhere. of T.G. Of Carr, which if you want to watch the rugby, and a lot of the commentary will be Osperla because the lads yeah, yeah. on the touchline can't speak uh, Irish at all. But there's kind of a nice thing about, you know, I have a reasonable command of Irish, I can understand everything that's going on, but for those who don't, they can still watch the rugby, enjoy it, get a, get a bit of a blast out of the whole thing. And that's about content. That probably does not apply to, to RNG in the same way. You know? although, although I think if you go to Balian Howan and, and the, the environs in which Tiji Cahar and um, Radio Nogeltuk are situated, um, they're very much part and parcel of that community. And they, people in that, those communities really feel they reflect their lives. Uh, and that's the reality. There's a real 
uh, live link with the, with those communities and and it creates value um, so, and beyond and some of the rest. Yeah, but it doesn't and, need and, a national and, FM stereo network. It doesn't. And, and in fact, DAB would solve all those problems. Absolutely. You know, you, <laughs> any, anyone else got a question? Yes, sir. Sorry, uh, just in, I suppose in relation to um, content for people, new people coming in, I, there was a report done by the BAI, and one of the things that came from that was that all of the people who were interviewed felt that there wasn't very much of Irishness within Irish television in particular, and that it was all very American or British, and they didn't see Irish content. Um, that's what I was getting from that, that, that piece. Um, and the other thing is, just in relation to radio, and, and we talk about Radio um, Nigel Thakta, um, there seems to be an attack on Lyric FM from RTE, and yet 2FM has been given funding over the last 10 years, um, which suggests that it's, that it's a, a kind of a, a golden goose of RTE, that it can't be got rid of, not got rid of, but it can't have any cuts to it. Um, and are the cuts fair within RTE, okay. is what I'm asking. The question there, Jim, I don't think you could call 2FM a golden goose because it would be laying golden eggs and making a, <laughs> making a pot of money for you, which it's not. No. Um, but it, it does earn a lot of money for us. Like, you know, uh, and that's the, the, but the key thing that 2FM does for RTE is it delivers us a demographic that no other station in RTE does, which is the younger demographic, the 15 to 24 and 15 to 34. And RTE has a, a, a mandate uh, to be a broadcaster that caters to every demographic across the country. Uh, and it's a very important part of our portfolio services that it's the one place where young people actually tune okay, in. Okay, but what, what about Lyric? I mean, Lyric is supposed to span the yeah. generations. It's, it's music that yeah. people of all ages like. Yeah, Lyric's going nowhere. Uh, do, which way do you mean that? <laughs> <laughs> which nowhere? You mean it's not going to be axed? No, it was never going to be axed. Okay. Or he never said it was axing Lyric. He said it might change it. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Okay, budgets for Lyric are lower than the budget for 2FM. Yeah, not by much. Okay. Uh, not by much. Not by much. Okay, anyone else got a question? Okay, we'll get a microphone to you if we can. I have a mic. Um, just budgets are, are, Scott Williams and Wireless, uh, budgets are, are decreased everywhere. I'd just like to ask Jim and Willie in the context of the conversation you've had regarding the future radio and getting away from the, the state broadcaster and the commercial broadcaster to talk about radio and ask them directly for what ideas they might have were those two sectors to work together more closely to pursue a better future for radio. Well, I think, sorry, Jim, I, the, the first one is in distribution. It's not a competition point. You know, we've seen, if you like, in the UK, the BBC dispose itself of its towers, right, and it's not in the distribution game. RT continues to have it for, for, for good reasons. Jim has touched on them. But that's something we could do. We had, could have a more unified, uh, probably more efficient FM, DAB, system across the country and that would be something that would be we could uh, talk about. I also think that you know RT is very important in the development of the radio sector in Ireland. It was started out, it, it, it caused this great grow for radio that we have and when it started out it took commercials from almost day one. So it means that you know thankfully the Irish audience can't go to a network that doesn't take advertising. So that we're, we're all quite Advertising has been socialised by both RTE and, may, and, and therefore paved the way for the commercial industry. So I think things around playout systems, things around distribution um, are certainly things that we can cooperate on. Uh, thing, and, and the other thing we can do is talking to government and the regulator. You know, for a long time, we didn't have even an IBI, as you remember, Scott, and all the radio stations queued up to talk to Celine and Michael and waste their time saying the same thing. It took a while for us to mature, I was in the independent sector then, and say, wouldn't we be better with you know, an organization that 
overarches all of that, and John does that very capably now. Uh, Jim, I, I believe. Yeah, I mean, and Scott knows this. Like, I think, and um, I might be wrong. It just feels to myself that we've taken the foot off a pedal a little bit in the Choose Radio campaign. Yeah. But I think really where we we should be coming together is. Uh, together in a campaign to support the radio industry and particularly uh, aimed at uh, uh, agencies and, and commercial buyers. I think the, you know, the, the strength of the radio industry in this country uh, has traditionally been very, uh, very good. Uh, I think we need to protect our uh, revenue sources. I think we can do that together. Uh, I don't think we work closely enough together on that, uh, it's my own personal opinion. I know you've done a lot of work on this, but um, I think we could be better. And I also think something that Roddy, Roddy touched on earlier, I think this whole um, attack on trust um, doesn't just uh, impact um, um, RTE, I think it impacts all radio. Um, and you see what's going on in the UK and what's gone, and gone on in the US. I think trust is a real, a uh, plus point for us in the radio industry and our relationship with, with our audiences. And I think we could campaign together on trust um, as an industry um, uh, and about news because, and I'm not saying, I'm not attacking any other sector because some of the other sectors, are, media sectors are very distressed, particularly newspapers. But it's in newspapers' in, interest to, 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 to knock us down, um, you know, because uh, they're competing for the same revenue stream, and it's in the um, um, the GAFA or the the um, you know Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon sector. Uh, it's also in their interest to knock us down as well. We should really come together and fight for the health of this sector to maintain our advertising pot to keep us uh, operating at the well, same level. I've just come back from the States and I was watching Mayor Bloomberg's campaign and his advertising campaign and it brought home to me again this strange thing we have in Europe, particularly in Ireland, and that is that we don't allow political parties access to advertising. I believe we should. And I'd be very interested to hear Roddy, what Roddy has to say about this. And the reason is simple. It is unbelievable in the 21st century that as a political candidate, the only thing you can do is get a piece of cardboard, climb up a pole, and put some stays around it. How is that a 21st century way? Social media, we learned. Social media. Yeah, like we, we, did, we, did, we, did, we did some research, Willie, on the social media just in the last week out of the election in terms of the time spent by topic and by party. And we found that 60% of the activity on Twitter, and on, on Twitter particularly, was Sinn Féin related or uh, generated by Sinn Féin. Yeah. So this is an unregulated space. Um, is it going to remain an unregulated space? Because if that's what you're competing with, uh, you know, what is the position oh, going to be? Okay, Celine and Roddy on that topic. Do you want to go first? Or? I'm equally interested <laughs> to hear what Roddy has to say in this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, my colleague, Kevin Rafter, Fred's Kevin Rafter, has written about this, and I mean, he's written a position paper which basically supports the idea, actually, that, that political advertising should be possible, mm -hmm. should be possible to buy it. Why make a distinction between that and any other product? Um, it, as you're aware, it's outlawed at the moment, um, although the definition of what constitutes political is a bit vague sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Promoting an issue can be regarded as political. Um, but there is a clear disparity between the way that it's regulated or unregulated, more mm -hmm. to the point, um, online. The, the current situation is that the, um, the gaffers, as you described them, have basically made a commitment that we will say this is where this is who paid for the ad, and it's an ad for yeah. a political party. But we did some research last year for the European elections, and it turns out that's not necessarily happening. Um, so even where there are, it's not regulation, but kind of internal commitments, you know, self-regulation, it doesn't seem to be actually adhered to. I, I'm not sure I can see a very strong argument against permitting political advertising with lots of caveats yeah. built in. Mm -hmm that yeah. don't allow a situation whereby you can... You can buy in, an in election. In a US state, you can be Mayor Bloomberg and you can buy an election. Yeah. You, you can, can buy, buy yourself more. into the primaries anyway. Yeah, that's for sure. and we can set up a process that does that. But I, I just make the point again about the poster. I saw it again just recently and I went, wow, is that how, as a candidate, I communicate with my potential yeah. voters? And, and you know there are rules about misrepresentation. Yeah. The candidates don't even look like themselves on the poster, which is what bothers me. 
Um, final words from you, Celine. Yeah, I think Michael referred earlier to the, the future of regulation um, here, and I think broadcast media will be aligned with on-demand media and regulation of the video sharing platforms. I think on the issue of political advertising specifically, it's very difficult, I think, to see, the, to sustain the case for the, the ban on, 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 uh, on broadcast media when it's so freely available. I think that debate needs to happen right across platforms so there's consistency and we would argue we've argued in our submission to government on, on online regulation that there's a there's the best opportunity for that is to have a single regulator that can actually look at it and try and level the playing pitch, pitch to some extent or at least ensure that on a principles basis that the same rules apply right across uh, broadcast right. and online media. Well look thank you all uh, thanks uh, to Roddy and Celine and Jim and Willie for a most informative hour and I hope you all enjoyed it. Give uh, our panel a round of applause. <laughs>